Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry over there. Tristan's reign of terror is over. (laughs) Yeah, Jerry had him killed. Yeah, he shouldn't have tried to take her place. I mean, he got what he deserved. Now there's just a grease spot on the carpet. Yeah, it was gross. You didn't have to leave him there for a week, Jerry. I thought that was a little weird also to bring in a uh, acid bath into the studio. Right. Well, it made sense once she dissolved him in acid. <laughs> uh, can I say something? Mm, yes. <laughs> the two that we're recording today, yeah, I feel like are such kind of classic core stuff you should know things. I know what you're going to say. That I'm surprised we haven't done them yet. I searched probably three times. Me too. Maybe five, Chuck. For tsunamis? Yes. Yeah. They, it does, like, we've gone over this stuff before, and I can't, I know. for the life of me, figure out what it is. The closest I could come possibly was rogue waves. Yeah, for sure. Or how Earthquakes. nuclear— Earthquakes. Yeah, or how nuclear meltdowns work when we when we talked specifically about the Fukushima incident. Yeah, I think that had to be what it is because I'm I'm still a little paranoid that we've <laughs> covered this before. Yeah, I am too. So we're paranoid together. Yay! But we'll uh, we'll fail together if we re-record an episode that we have done before. Boo. Just couldn't find. But it's okay. We'll be all right, right, everybody. Right. All right. So we're those doing... are both of our listeners. Yeah. Uh, Chuck and Buck. <laughs> wow. I know. Isn't that random that <laughs> one of our two listeners is also named Chuck? Did you see that movie? No. You know that was a movie, right? No. Yeah, it was a movie called Chuck and Buck. Was it a porno? Not exactly. Well, what was what was it about? Uh, it was, you know, Mike White, right? No. Uh, You'd recognize him. He's an actor and a writer, uh, one of my favorite writers in Hollywood. Okay. And he, it was his first little indie film uh, starring him and one of the brothers, one of the filmmaking brothers, the Weiss brothers. Man, you are not talking my language right now. Yeah. Anyway, it it was him and he played sort of a creepy guy that had a a, a unhealthy crush on this other guy. And it got made for some very uncomfortable circumstances. Uh, you're talking about, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. <laughs> I know the movie you're talking about. I never saw that one either. Though. Oh, goodness. Hey, speaking of, dude, I saw Norm MacDonald stand up. I still haven't seen Hitler's that Hitler's Dog. Is it great? Yes. Man, he's probably the, best. the Probably the best stand up on Netflix right now. Ugh, I've been meaning to watch it, and he's just a treasure. <laughs> It's it's him, he's at his peak. It's great. I don't want to talk it up too much. Uh-huh. Just go in there fresh. It's just good Norm Macdonald stand up. You don't want to talk it up too much, other than saying that it's the best thing. On Netflix. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm actually downplaying it right now. Okay, that's how good it is. Yeah, I got to check that out. All right, so back to it. We actually started off talking about tsunamis, and then veer, 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 we veered off. We're right now, back in it. Now we're back in it. So. Uh, or we'll talk about some of the more famous tsunamis. Like they've definitely been in the public consciousness over the last in this millennium mm-hmm. so far. Yeah, just because there've been two colossally huge ones yeah. that caused so much destruction, um, which is ironic because we're finally now getting to the point where we can warn people early about a tsunami, and yet two of the worst tsunamis in history whether it's through the human toll or the financial toll, Mm -hmm. occurred within eight years of each other within the last 20 years. Yeah. It's it's kind of surprising what you know a little more about tsunamis. Yeah, so, uh, and I I found our own article to be pretty good, actually. Well, it was written by three people, for goodness sake. Uh, Well, how can that go wrong? Including Robert Lamb. Uh, Well, I always stand up for that guy's writing. For sure. Uh, So, tsunami is... Uh, we should just discover the word, first of all. It is a Japanese word, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the T-S-U of tsunami means harbor, and the N-A-M-I means waves. And that is what a tsunami is. It is a series of waves, generally, or a, or a wave. Although, 
we will clear up. It's not exactly what you might think from Hollywood movies. No, it's really, really, really not. Yeah, uh, but it's in the ocean, obviously, and these things can be as high as 100 feet, and get this, they can travel up to, and in fact, the 2004 tsunami traveled about 300 miles per hour. Yes. And that is not at land, but through the ocean, 300 miles an hour. Yeah. And I've actually seen them that they're clocked at 600 miles per hour. Man, can you imagine? No, I really can't. And I also have trouble with the math itself. Like, so, there's some weird formula for calculating how fast a tsunami's traveling, uh-huh. but it's the square root of the G force. You just lost me. <laughs> times, I know, <laughs> times the depth of the ocean where yeah. the tsunami originated. Boy. That's, I don't understand how that equals how fast the tsunami's traveling. So I'm just going to take it for their word that they can get up to 600 miles an hour. Yeah. That's crazy. So, all right, let's talk about tsunami. So, a tsunami is a what most people think of as a giant wave. It's not necessarily what you're thinking of, like you said, Chuck. Yeah. But it is a wave in some way, shape, or form. And it follows a lot of the um, – it has a lot of the same, same – um, traits or characteristics of a wave that you see like on the surface of the ocean when you're sitting there on the beach and the waves are rolling in. Right. Te- technically, that's that's the same family. That's the little brother of a tsunami. Yeah. And so uh, any kind of wave has a couple of components to it. It has the trough, which is the lowest point. Mm-hmm. It has the crest, which is the highest point. And, and happiest point, generally. Yeah, typically. That's where the surfers like to hang out. Yeah. Um, You measure them from the height of the crest to the trough. That's the wave height, right? Mm -hmm. And then the distance between the crest of one wave and the crest of another is one wavelength. So it's weird to think of because you think of the wave as just like, you know, the part that's kind of curving up out of the ocean that you see in like graphic design or something like that, right? Yeah. The the wave is actually much bigger than that. It goes from the the front the top of the crest all the way forward and includes the back of the wave in front of it, technically. Yeah. That's one wave. Yeah. And and it includes the trough and the crest. So, bam, that's a wave, whether it's a tidal wave or an ocean surface wave. Right. And then the frequency, which is uh, what you would call the wave period, is it the time for two waves in a row to hit the same point? Yeah. So, if you, like, had a buoy... Right. And a wave went past, and then another wave went past. The time between, that's the wave period, right? Yeah. Or if you were a buoy. <laughs> sure. We should maybe do one on, uh, und- I don't know if it's big enough for a full episode, but undertow would be kind of interesting to cover at some point. I'm surprised we haven't done that one either. Yeah. That's, uh, last time I was at uh, in <clears throat> uh, Charleston, mm-hmm. day two and three were fine, but that first day was an incredible undertow and they even talked about it on the news it was pretty dangerous yeah so were you in the water oh yeah i was having fun but (laughs) it's one of those things where you're playing in the water and you look up it's like wow emily's a mile away now yeah that's very dangerous it was really carrying me down the beach and the skin has been peeled off of your ankles and calves well yeah you're just fighting through it right until you eventually say i'm 47 years old what the heck am i doing i'm gonna go lay down right (laughs) with a with a gin and tonic right so you got it figured out, Chuck. You know that? Oh, I have my moments. So when we're talking about waves on an ocean, back to waves, by the way. Yes. When when you're talking about waves on an ocean, like the, the waves people normally think of, um, those are actually generated by wind. And yeah. we definitely talked about this somewhere before. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because I think most people think of mm-hmm. gravitational pull and things like that, atmospheric pressure, and they, they contribute. Mm-hmm. But wind is kind of the most common way that a wave will form. Right. And it does so by basically on a molecular level, and this this article really goes into granular detail, but basically air molecules push water molecules along Mm -hmm. and create these circular patterns. Not circular on top of the surface, but if you're looking at like a cross section of the water, circular from the top into the water, usually down about a meter underwater, and it can get higher and higher as the wind gets stronger and stronger. 
right? Yeah, and these little guys uh, are known as capillary waves, which is the cutest wave, I guess. Sure. Uh, and then they just keep circling around uh, vertically, like you said, until eventually it, you know, it sort of dissipates the deeper it goes, obviously. It does, but so depending on how strong the wind is, when that wave starts to whip up and froth up and, and, and get like the back to it, right? Yeah. It, it has more surface for the wind to press on. So the wind now can push it along even further. So it can pick up height, speed, velocity, all that jam. And it can get kind of big and they can get kind of fast. But the point is this. What you're seeing is not water being pushed along. What you're seeing is the transfer of kinetic energy from the wind into water, and what a wave is, the movement of that energy through water. Yeah, it's an important distinction, I think. Mm-hmm. It really is, because if you, if you are at one point and you see a wave and you touch it and you somehow scramble forward and catch it w- when it's like 50 yards down or towards shore, mm-hmm. you touch it again, you're actually touching two different bits of water. It's not the same water moving from point A to point B. Yeah. It's the energy moving through it. And it is. It's 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 a bit of a brain buster if you start to overthink it, but it's also extraordinarily simple if you don't. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so that's that's a wave, okay? Yeah. That's a surface wave. Mm-hmm. Tsunamis are not like that. No, and if you if you want to understand how a tsunami is formed, and I think we talked about this in earthquakes as well, which is why it all rings so familiar. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that is not always, but that is generally what kicks off in a, in in the case of the most two recent devastating ones. Uh, mm-hmm. What kicks off a tsunami will be an underwater earthquake, and those happen. If you took out all the ocean's water, you would really just need to think of the seafloor just like you would the rest of. Uh, the hard stuff on the earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well put. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I do. It's like if you're on a on a mountain and you come to a valley, it's the same thing that's just underwater. Yeah, so like this is where we talk about plate tectonics. The, we have these huge plates, a series of them, that make up what's called the lithosphere, uh, and that is the top layer of the earth. And they make up everything that you see, including what's underwater. Mm-hmm. And they float on top of the uh, stenosphere. Do you think I said that correctly? I think so. And I, I remember talking about this as sort of a, a – is, is that the lube? Yeah, the hot <laughs> magma lube. Gross. So it, because it's it's not exactly lube, but it's almost like hot asphalt more. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. It's, it's a solid, but it's a very viscous solid, right? Yeah. And so those plates float on top of the asthenosphere, and there are boundaries between the plates. And where those boundaries connect, all sorts of things can happen, right? Oh, yeah, man. You can have one plate going upward while the other plate's going downward, so they're sliding alongside each other. Mm -hmm. You can have one, um, you can have them pushing up into one another, and you have mountain ranges. Sure. Then you can have ones where one slips under another one, and that creates ocean trenches when it's underwater. But you have to think about this. This isn't happening quickly. This happens at the rate of about um, an inch, about two and a half centimeters per year. That's how slowly these things are moving when they're interacting with one another. Yeah, but they're they're huge, and it's a lot of force, even though it's going slow. So uh, what you were talking about is subduction. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes in cases of subduction, you can have a lighter plate that just sort of snaps upward uh, when they meet each other and they say hi. Lighter plate snaps up, mm-hmm. and that's what causes the earthquake. And a tremendous amount of of rock and force shoot directly upward from the floor of the ocean. Right. So now a tsunami has just been born because that's what it is, right? With a normal wave, you've got wind blowing the water or wind blowing through the water. You have with a tsunami, this huge release of energy upward through the water column toward the surface. And this, this energy is like, yeah, we're going up. And right when it hits the surface, it really comes in contact with gravity that says, no, you're not. And they go, yeah, okay, we're going outward then. 
Right. And they, it spreads outward. And this article gives a great analogy because it really drives home what we're dealing with here. If you take a pebble and you throw it into a pond, uh-huh. it makes that ripple, right? Yeah. It's the same exact thing, but rather than a rock going into the water, this is the force of, of um, an earthquake under the water going upward out. Right. And so that upward out movement, that is the tsunami waves that are being created. And it spreads outward in different ripples, just like if you throw a rock in the pond. Should we take a break? I think we should. I'm getting kind of worked up. No, I love it. Uh, it's the earth sciences, man. That's your jam. Yeah, I, they. Uh, yeah, that's true. All right, so we're, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, the speed of a tsunami and how that happens right after this. Stop. You, you, you know. Stop. 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 You should know. No. Stop. You, you, you know. Stop. 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 You should know. Stop. You should know. All right. So when we left off, I promised talk of tsunami speed. And this is where it gets a little like uh, this is where, like, if you've learned it from movies, then you've probably learned the wrong thing. Uh, Because a tsunami moves the fastest in deep water. So when a tsunami is going 300 miles an hour and, and you're uh, of course, they're monitoring things, which we'll talk about with all, all sorts of advanced equipment. But if you're just looking with your naked eye mm-hmm. and a tsunami's going at 300 miles an hour through the ocean, you might see like a three foot high rise, Maybe. yeah, if that, on the surface of the of the ocean, where you where things really take action is when it gets close to shore because it really slows down and it gets a lot taller because it's shallower water, right. Like the the shelf, the the coastal shelf that gets shallower and shallower pushes it upward. Yeah. So it slows and grows taller, right? Yeah, depending on the topography of what's going on wherever the tsunami is reaching shore, it's going to have a big difference, of course. But the point is, is it's compressing all this energy mm-hmm. upward as it gets closer and it slows down. And it's like it's very difficult to to grasp how enormous the tsunami um, waves are, especially considering that, what, like, three feet, like a meter maybe, uh, of of surface water will be disturbed to, to look like a wave, like a normal yeah. wave, right? Oh, yeah. But, but uh, that wave goes all the way down to the ocean floor, often miles. So you have basically what amounts to a three-mile tall wave That's a tsunami rather than, you know, a wave that you see on the surface. It's maybe six feet tall and then it's disturbing water three feet under the water. This is a three mile tall wall of water moving out in a ripple formation in in what's called a wave train. So successive waves like Uh those ripples spreading out from that pebble um, that are three miles tall and many, many, many miles across just coming at you basically yeah and when i said slow down it you know 30 to 40 miles an hour at land is still really fast (laughs) obviously it's not 300 but um you know right before the tsunami happens on land it it can be really creepy on shore you're going to notice this beach water rising and falling in odd ways and sometimes it will suck all that water out And, and i believe that movie uh the impossible didn't it show that? I don't know. I, I've seen that in a movie, and it's yeah. really creepy looking. And apparently, that's it is actually very creepy looking in real life too. That's not like a movie thing. It can suck all that water out, <clears throat> and it may not look like a movie wave coming in. It's more likely to look like just a huge flood coming your way. Right, right, like a very fast moving tide, which is I think one reason people call them tidal waves, even though the tides have nothing to do with it. Yeah, but it doesn't look like that huge wave that you see in like um, the day after tomorrow or something like that. It's, right, it's it's like a very fast moving, fast rising flood water, and on this on this fast moving flood water, you have like 
huge raging rivers on top of the water, too. Yeah. It's just this huge chaotic mass of water that is um, that is moving inland very quickly and with an enormous amount of destructive force. Yeah, and then once it gets there, depending on where it lands, you might have like areas that were you think are sheltered because of high dunes or you're in a an inlet or a bay. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they can act as like funnels. Like if the tsunami goes through there, you just don't know what kind of destructive power it's going to have until it interacts with the the topography and the land features that it hits. No, but it does do some interesting stuff. So um, when so first of all, that one thing where the the bay or the harbor or whatever gets the water sucked out of it is called drawback. Yeah, and they've studied that and actually concluded what you're seeing is the trough of the wave. That's oh, the trough of the first tsunami wave. So if that's the part that reaches land first, uh-huh. the trough. That's going to have drawback. So it's not oh. always going to have drawback, just only if the trough arrives first. The crest could arrive first, and then all you're seeing is this flood water coming out of nowhere. Huh. But um, there's also supposedly the sound of a freight train or a jet coming at you. So it's like a horrific sound, yeah. too, that's coming with this wall of water. But one of the other things um, I think you're about to talk about was wraparound effect. Yeah, and that's along like a, a coastline when— I sort of I sort of thought of it as like uh or maybe it's harbor resonance like I'm not sure which is which but when mm-hmm. you have like a fish tank and yeah. you imagine just shaking it with your all your force and it's just banging off of interior walls is that Back wrap around No that's harbor resonance Oh okay but that is so you know when you're doing that right like it just picks up more and more force with each each movement each oscillation from one side to the other right And those poor fish Imagine, <laughs> I know they're like, please stop. This. Empty fish tank, everyone. Surely this is illegal. <laughs> um, but the, imagine that happening in the harbor. Like, that's what happens in the harbor. So it just gets even more destructive. Yeah. But the wraparound effect, this article just totally, completely gets it wrong. Yeah, I didn't it, quite get it. It's not the wraparound effect at all. So the wraparound effect is if you have a tsunami wave, remember these are many, many miles across and they're coming inland, if they encounter, say, like a barrier island, just a little island, right? Mm-hmm. You would think that the barrier island would slow it down, maybe make it, um, take it a little easier on the land, the shoreline behind the barrier island. Yeah. It doesn't do that at all. The barrier island actually amplifies the um, tsunami wave, and they couldn't figure out how, but they knew that it could amplify it by like 70%. Wow. But it doesn't make any sense. So they started studying it, and I'm not sure who, so I'm just going to call them they for now. Mm -hmm. But um, they they figured out what happens is the tsunami wave is split into two by this island. And for a very brief time, when they come back together, they are basically doubled in force. Uh It's like two waves together now with this force, and it amplifies it onto the land behind it and makes it way worse. That kind of makes sense if— I picture it in my head. Well, they actually do have cool pictures of it, too, I think on a NOAA site. So look up, like, wraparound effect tsunamis, and it shows, like, you know, just part one, two, three, four, and all these, I think, six pictures, and it really drives it home. But, I mean, it it definitely does make sense, but it also intuitively doesn't at all, you know? Yeah, and, you know, obviously they've been in the news in the last, like, 10 or 15 years, like you said, and the (laughs) devastation— that can happen from a tsunami is just, uh, it's immense because people live along coastlines and and we'll, we'll get to early warning later, but no matter what kind of early warning you have, you may can get some people out of there, but it's going to wreck e- everything in its path. Right. And that happened uh, very famously uh, recently a couple of times in December 26, 2004 in the Indian Ocean. There was a massive 9.1 magnitude earthquake that uh, apparently it shook buildings 1,200 miles away in Thailand. Yeah, that's a big one. And they always, you know, the I guess the Big Mac version of earthquakes is Hiroshima <laughs> bombs. <laughs> right. <laughs> the magnitude of 23,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs. Yeah. No small is, earthquake. No, not at all. I think the the next most recent one was in 1960. The next biggest one was in 1960, and it was like a 9.4 to 9.6, and this is a 9.1. 
So it was no slouch as far as earthquakes go. But the thing about this, the 2004 um, earthquake that hit Sumatra, it was one of the deadliest natural disasters in human history. Yeah. It killed like about 230,000 people. Yeah, man. And ruined. No, I can't. Like, if you go through the list of like deadly tsunamis over history, yeah. Um, I mean, the next, the next largest I saw was one in Japan in, um, I think, uh, the, yeah, the nineteenth century that yeah. killed tw- twenty six thousand people. So a tenth of the the two thousand four tsunami. And the reason why it was so deadly was it hit eleven different countries that were fully engorged with tourists on the holiday season. Yeah. Um, so there were a lot of people there, including a lot of people who had never really been introduced to tsunami preparedness or knew what was going on. Sure. If there was drawback, and I think there may have been actually, I think I saw footage of the drawback for that one. Yeah. So you're right. Um, people were kind of like going out into the harbor, like, what's this? Yeah. And when that happens, when the drawback happens and you're seeing the trough of that first tsunami wave, you have seconds, maybe minutes to get away, not go f- closer to it. Yeah, but it wouldn't have made a difference in that case. Pro- probably not. You no. know, it, it hit and it was enormous and huge. And uh, yeah, it just it killed a lot of people very quickly. Because even if you do have the time to do it, you have to get no less than a mile inland and or no less than a hundred feet above sea level. Yeah. And you have a very short time to do that. So my friend Dave uh, Barnhart, who listens to the show. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Uh, he is a documentary filmmaker um, for nonprofits. And he, he went down there and did a series of documentary uh, updates over the years. He, and I can't remember how many people, but he followed specifically the lives an aftermath of of several different uh, individuals and families, uh, and you know went down there himself and and shot this stuff. I believe in Indonesia, and um, I don't know if he's still following up, but he did it for many years. And I saw a lot of this stuff, and he won some awards for it. It's just just unbelievable the stories of uh, devastation and then perseverance for some of these people that like started over with nothing in the worst, most unsanitary, devastating conditions you can imagine living in. Yeah, I can. I, I was going to say I can imagine. I can't imagine. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just heartbreaking to see this stuff. Like quarter of a million people, it's just it's hard to even fathom. There, um, There's this one story Yumi got obsessed with at the time about a, a kid named Baby 81. He was like the the eighty first baby to be brought into uh, I think a hospital in Sri Lanka or something afterward, uh-huh. and there was this huge like media publicity circus around whose kid it was, and supposedly they were reporting that there was like nine different families claiming him, and there was a huge battle over it. When really it was just this one poor family who knew that it was their son, and who went to go make a claim, but the the they actually got arrested for trying to take the baby out of the hospital and had to wait like a month before they got him back Wow! through like a DNA test. But it's just like, like first of all, tsunami. Secondly, their baby gets swept away out of the mom's arms in the tsunami. Yeah. And then when they finally find out the baby's alive, they go to take him back and they can't. And just like the idea that, that it, they have to prove that it's their son, it just kept yeah. getting worse and worse and worse. And apparently they had to move because they were known as the tsunami family. Oh, oh man. here's the last little bit for you. They went and appeared on Good Morning America in the United States and told their story. And when they got back, they were denied disaster aid because everyone assumed that they had been paid for their appearance and Ugh. that they didn't need the money, even though they hadn't been paid for it. Wow. Isn't that awful? Yeah, one, I mean, one family that happened to all of that. The the story of uh, the movie The Impossible is a true story and an amazing story, and uh, just a tough movie to watch, you know. Yeah. So I was thinking back, like I saw that within the last like year or so, I think, mm-hmm. and I was thinking back to like some of those scenes, and now that I'm thinking about, I'm like, uh, how did they even shoot that stuff? Like how? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, did they? F- 
did they flood a town somewhere and start filming and put the know, actors man. in there? Because that's what it looks like for yeah, sure. Yeah, it was, it was pretty remarkable what they did, like cinematically yeah. for sure. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's very tough to watch for sure. Uh, so that was um, 2004. Two, yeah. And then just, what, seven or eight years ago uh, in 2011 in March, and we mm-hmm. definitely talked about this in the nuclear meltdown, but mm-hmm. the, the tsunami that hit Japan, this one had a, had a horrific effect in and of itself just from the tsunami. I don't know what the final death toll, but it was well over four or 5,000, I think. I think the official death toll is now at 20,000 dead. Oh, wow, because I knew and, for a while there were just people missing. Right. Man. I think they finally combined them all and just said 20,000 is the official death toll. The The damage is upwards of 309 billion U.S. dollars. It's the, it's the most expensive natural disaster in history. Well, yeah, and this one was noted not only for its, uh, for its devastation and for <clears throat> human life and money, but uh, obviously— the generator of the, how do you pronounce it, Fukushima? Daiichi. Daiichi nuclear facility. Mm-hmm. That was where it made, uh, I don't know about the most news, but that's what really set this one apart. You had a tsunami disable uh, a nuclear reactor for a brief time, mm-hmm. which is bad news. Yeah, it, like it shut down like it should because I guess they had seismic detectors that all, like tripped an automatic like safeguard system. Sure. But the power got knocked out, so there wasn't any cooling system. And it's not like it just goes from incredibly hot nuclear reaction to, yeah. you know, room temperature immediately. You need to keep cooling it down, and they didn't. And apparently from that meltdown, and I don't remember talking about this in the episode. This is insane. But the the meltdown created radiation that tore apart the water vapor. That's amazing. And so the hydrogen separated, and so the place filled with hydrogen gas, and it started exploding, and that's what blew a hole in the reactor and created the leak. I don't remember that. That's nuts. I wonder if that was found out afterward and not available to us at the time. Oh, I'll bet you're right. That sounds like something that they, like, I don't don't even know if at the time we recorded it, they knew how the breach occurred. Yeah, because we did, we recorded within like a week or so of it happening, I think. So um, that place is still, still, like, way hot. They're send, they send in robots now. They're trying to figure out what robot to use. And they haven't hit on it quite yet because the place melts robots that go in to try to clean up the still. Uh, mess. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oof. All right. Well, we're going to take another break, talk a little bit about how we're getting better at predicting uh, earthquakes and then uh, also what it means for marine life right after this. Stop. You, you, you know. Stop. 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 You should know. No. Stop. You, you, you know. Stop. 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 You should know. Stop. You should know. Okay, Charles, we're back. I also want to say oh, real quick before we do that, um, there are two, at least two articles, and I believe they're written by the same guy who went and covered the 2011 um, tsunami in the aftermath. One is called Ghosts of the Tsunami. Uh-huh. It's called, it's, it's, I think in the London Review of Books, it is amazing. It's about how these these people in Japan like live among ghosts. As far as they're concerned, they see like ghosts everywhere of the their, the people who died in the tsunami. It's a, one of the better articles I've ever read in my life. The other one is The School Beneath the Wave, and that was in The Guardian. And um, it's it tells the tale of this one specific school that um, this guy who covered the tsunami knew all these different stories and all these tales um, that came out of it. And this one, I believe he says that he um, put off writing about until last because it's so terrible because a whole school of children just got swept away by the tsunami because the grown-ups wouldn't listen to the kids who they'd trained to respond correctly to a tsunami and they just wouldn't listen to them and and it just swept away basically this whole village's group of children would they have gotten out 
Yeah, if they'd listened to the kids, probably most of, if not all, would have survived. Oh, man. Yeah, it's it's a tough one to read for sure, but both of them are definitely worth it. Uh, so when it comes to predicting these, um, obviously, and the same with earthquakes and tornadoes and any natural disaster, what they're trying to do is just get better and better about getting as much time beforehand as possible because – uh, and this article very simply points out, like, there's you cannot stop it. There's nothing you can do. You can't build anything that can thwart or divert a tsunami. So the only chance that people have of survival is getting as early warning as possible to get as many people out of there as possible. We'll still destroy the towns and villages and cities, but uh, at least you could save some human lives. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of, I mean, it's getting much better, but a lo- most of the studying takes place afterward so you can try and get better about before. Yeah, and one way that you study tsunamis is through things like um, eyewitness reports. Yeah. You go f- you go look to see how high the debris made it up to. Yeah, and how far it went. Yeah, um, how wide it was. Um, some of the debris will end up like on the other side of the world sometimes if the tsunami's big enough. Because remember, you you hear about the tsunami where it hit, you know, the the closest place, the place it devastated the most, whether it was Sumatra in 2004 or um, Japan in 2011. But like that, say like the Japan one, it took, it carried stuff all the way over to California. Yeah. Like it, it goes in both directions. It's just California was way further away, so it didn't experience the destruction like Japan did, which is right up on the place where it happened. Yeah, so, you know, equipment-wise, they use um, buoys out in the ocean. They use tide gauges. They have tide stations that measure just the smallest little changes in sea level. Mm-hmm. They do have uh, seismograph stations that record, uh, you know, underwater earthquake activity. Um, And anything, apparently, that's 7.5 or higher that is under the ocean earthquake-wise is when an official tsunami watch is issued. Right. So when the tsunami watch is issued, then you won't hear about it quite yet. They That means that they start checking out their gauge stations, and if the gauge station reports a tsunami— Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, I think it's. I don't know if it's a. I guess it's a change in tide is what the gauge station measures. Right. Yeah. So if there's a sudden change in tide that doesn't coincide with the tidal schedules, they'll say, "Yeah, that's a tsunami." Send out the alarm, and then they alert every like the public through text messages or TV or you know the Paul Revere, however they do it. How early can they? Do you know how early they can get this stuff now? I. I, I saw minutes Jeez. for for the 2011 one, which like that's all that in some cases that's all you need. If you're in a a tall building, you just keep going up. No, well, that's true. That can help. Or if you are close enough, you're getting your car and start driving as far inland as you can. Minutes can help, and they actually think that the the death toll would have been way higher in Japan had they not learned as much from the 2004 tsunami and set up emergency systems like they had, that the death toll would have been much worse. It's just the reason why it got as high as 20,000 is because it was such a big tsunami. Like it topped like 100 and almost 130 feet. Yeah. It was just enormous. That's That's what accounted for the destructive force. Yeah, and the whole time I was researching this stuff, I I didn't see anything in our article that talked about sea life because I was thinking, what's it like to be a fish when a 300-mile-an-hour tsunami rolls through? (laughs) And uh, it can be devastating. Like the the base of the wave can completely change and rewrite the topography of the seafloor. Really bad erosion will happen. And the what they call the benthic ecosystem, which is the, you know, the very sea bottom ecosystem with all the crustaceans and sea snails and worms and stuff, mm-hmm. it can just wreck it. Uh, coral reefs can be destroyed, um, and in fact, in 2004, uh, it it completely wrecked the coral reefs mm-hmm. around the Indian Ocean's coastlines. Uh, seagrass beds, mangrove forest, all these wetlands uh, can be super vulnerable, and then species invasion, like you were saying, stuff can move thousands and thousands of miles. That happens with sea life, too. Oh, wow. So you can get an algae, uh, and in fact, they have recorded like algae and other organisms 
and like Oregon that came from Japan that have never been there before. So sometimes that can be bad. Some, you know, sometimes it works out and they just say, all right, we'll set up camp here, but they can displace native species. So that's all a consideration and could not find anything specifically about literally in the water, like what happens to a whale that's, yeah, that's swimming along and then 300 miles an hour comes through. Like, does it just go kaboom and the whale explodes kind of thing? Because I could kind of see that happening. I don't know. Or is it just like being in a washing machine for a minute and then the yeah. whale's like, what the heck was that all about? What a rush. It's weird. Who knows? Hopefully, hopefully, Chuck. Let me, let me, we have some very, very sharp listeners who I'll bet some of which are uh, marine biologists. Sure. So we want to hear from you guys. What happens to a whale that gets hit by a tsunami. And that's us asking it from our eight-year-old hearts. And we're going to go play with our Tonka <laughs> trucks now while we wait for the answer. Yeah, and of course anything within the, you know, I'm not sure how much distance, but anything close to the inland part will just be washed ashore. So, mm-hmm. I mean, millions and millions of bits of sea life are now deposited on dry land. Yeah, and we should say so so for the the unfortunate ones, I mean they're if you're a fish and you're getting smacked around with this debris now, like you're getting run into a house that'll kill you. Um there's all sorts of obstacles that aren't out in the water that are now in your way because you're being pushed inland in this huge surge of flood water. Yeah. But one of the other destructive forces of, of tsunamis is that they recede. And when they recede, they take all that stuff back out with them, too. So maybe your house survived the initial inundation, yeah. but it's not necessarily going to survive all that debris being pulled on it as it's all pulled back outward into the ocean, too. Yeah. They just go from bad to worse from moment to moment, basically. Well, and I, don't, I think it slipped by. I don't think we mentioned, too, that it, it's, <clears throat> nev- it's not just that first wave. Like, you can get secondary f- flood pushes up to like an hour and a half later. Yes, thank you. So that whole wave train, right? You get the initial wave and you get another one or the initial flood water and then another one, another one. Um, Yeah, I saw actually up to like a couple hours later and people have died going back thinking after the Well, that's over. Right, exactly. They go back and then it's like, nope, here comes round two. Jeez. Yeah. I can't believe we haven't done this one before. (laughs) We definitely haven't. I looked a bunch... Yeah, I did too. Yeah. Um, and I also tried every word combination I could think of and nothing came up. I even tried spelling it S O O N A M I. That sounds like us, man. <laughs> um, I got one more. You ready? Yeah. The tallest tsunami wave ever recorded. Oh, boy. It was 1958 in Latuya Bay, Alaska. It reached 520 meters or 1,710 feet above oh, sea my God. level. Wow. Can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, that's like the tallest skyscrapers. It's up there for sure. Just coming at you. Yep. Well, if you want to know more about tsunamis, you can uh, search that word. Don't spell it S-O-O-N-A-M-I. It's spelled T-S-U-N-A-M-I, I I think. Uh, In the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I spelled some stuff, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this story from a uh, nice lady from a strawberry farmer. How about that? Those are great stories. Uh, hey, guys. Stumbled upon your podcast and have become obsessed. Uh, my husband and I own a strawberry farm. Doesn't that sound lovely? It really does. What a nice way to live, you know? <laughs> Man. And I recently started listening uh, while I'm working outside. The other day I was walking the fields and listening to an older one on cremation. and had a story. Uh, My mom's dad passed away in the early 90s when I was very young. In 2012, my grandma lost the family home in Long Island, New York, to Hurricane Sandy. My grandma had an additional home in Florida uh, and moved there. The following summer, my mom and dad drove out to New York to pack up what was left of the house before it was going to be demolished. My parents found this little wooden box with no labels. My dad tried to open it and could not, and unknown to my mom at the time, he put it in the van, drove it back home to Wisconsin. Uh, when my mom found it, she asked my grandma what it was, and she replied, Oh, yeah, that's your father. <laughs> I'm just trying to do my best Long Island accent. You did a great one. Uh, needless to say, they were glad that they were unsuccessful in opening the box. My mom rightfully labeled the box, and now we all get to see Grandpa every time we visit their home. 
Thanks for entertaining me while I walk up and down rows of strawberries, checking on plants and weeds eight acres at a time by hand. Mow the lawn or hand prune. Ten acres of strawberry plants. She's just rubbing it in now. (laughs) Uh, P.S. Will you ever do a show in Milwaukee? Well, Danielle Clark, we have done a show in Milwaukee, and it was great, so... I'm sure we'll come back at some point. Yeah. Either there or uh, Madison. Yeah, or maybe both, because I think we found out, like, they don't actually drive down the road to one another. It's weird. It is weird. (laughs) Well, uh, if you have a great story about something we talked about, like Danielle, thanks, by the way, Danielle. Um, If you want to let us know about it, you can tweet to us. We're all over Twitter. Uh, You can check us out on Facebook. We're on that, too. (laughs) <laughs> you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. <laughs> <laughs>